children a little bit of not talk on the fly, seeing as how I don't have a big screen, because I was going to do some close formal analysis to on one of these series for you to kind of understand some of the things um, about Richard Tully's art. So in favor of that, will be a little more general um, because of that. Um, but I can have any questions um, as a group or, or individually after if you have any other, other specific things about Tunnel's art. I should say this, my um, talk today is from a larger project on which I'm working uh, that is um, also shared in this title. It's my dissertation uh, for my degree in the history of art. And um, I am the first to examine Richard Tunnel's art in terms of seriality. That is to say, I argue that almost all the work he makes are series. But a lot of people will not say that because they don't look like series that we normally see in art. Um, they, they defy certain kinds of convention. So uh, with that said, uh, this, this paper involves um, a lot of, excuse me, this larger project involves a lot of philosophy. Uh, yet today I'm choosing one system and I'm choosing one way in which the Liz applies to that. Um, he is just one of the philosophers that are, that's involved in this um, dissertation. So. Since 1964, the American artist Richard Tuttle has worked almost entirely in series, producing approximately 300 discrete series in various media. Yet his series differ significantly from what we have come to regard as conventional serial art. Initially codified in the movements of pop art and minimalism, the serial art practice followed a systematic process adhered to order and logic and understood the work as self-exhausted. Some serial works are based on the repetition of a single thing, like Andy Warhol's mechanically printed images of Marilyn Monroe, while others depict progressions based on mathematical formulas, as we see here in Donald Judd, um, a series of modular wall pieces that are generated according to the Fibonacci sequence. Although Tuttle employs at times identical materials and similarly formed objects in his series, salient features of the conventional serial logic, his series do not follow discernible patterns or logic, at least initially. Instead, they appear incoherent, unfinished, and willfully unresolved, as, each, each, as if each object of the series represented a new and different moment in the provisional unfolding, and moreover, an uncertain process. What is more, the final object in a tunnel series always seems to be an abrupt break or an arbitrary end, which seems to suggest the series could have continued if allowed. Hence, with tunnel serial art, we always feel as if we are in the middle of something, somehow, witness to a process that is still ongoing and still opaque. Taking incoherence and irresolution to be purposeful components of Tuttle's art, I consider his series to be those that are in the perpetually in between, an argument theoretically motivated in part by the philosophy of Deleuze, whose career is largely contemporaneous with Tuttle's practice. Emerging coincidentally in the mid to late 1960s, that is, their kind of mature work, and incidentally during the period in which serial art practice was codified by pop art and minimalist art, both Tuttle and Deleuze, I argue, invent and continue to elaborate within their respective disciplines a radical concept of seriality. A seriality that, as we shall see, is compellingly linked by an interest in the in-between. But first, an analysis of tunnel seriality in microcosm is necessary. And for this paper, I take as my quick case study the series entitled Systems. Composed of 12 disparate pieces, some of which you see here, systems flouts at the outset unconventional systematic notions. In a brief survey, we can see just how varied these pieces are as they shift between the vertical and the horizontal, between frameworks that are structured and relatively geometric, and others that are organic and casual, and between sparse ornamentation and <coughs> flamboyant elaboration. While this 
quick examination underscores a sense of disorder and inconsistency across the series. This is also detectable within individual works. And indeed, it seems as if the disorder was first emerging from within these disparate systems. Consider this one, for example, with the detail. One of the stable geometric structures appears to be in distress. Above a central pedestal in the platform is a suspension of black mesh haphazardly encased by this kind of uh, uh, flimsy wooden armature. The mesh seeps from <coughs> it, fails to coalesce or to be contained within. Moreover, panels of unpainted firewood precariously lean against the system's otherwise structured foundational platform, while a piece of foam resembling a kind of luridly painted doormat seems to fluidly ooze from the uppermost part of the base. It would appear then as if this structure was fluctuating, as if still in formation. Yet for all the ways in which there is disruption and movement within and among these systems, a sense of visual consistency is nonetheless detectable. The majority of these 12 systems share a minimalist modular framework and some variation of a platform base while others are constructed directly on the gallery floor and include, in, in doing so, only these kind of structural stacks. In fact, the more that we examine this series, the more that it seems to conflate differences with similarities, method with offhandedness, a perception that is made all the more provocative in light of the series' sequential title, a fact that I purposely withheld until now. Given chronologically over the course of their two-year production from 2010 to 2011, the sequencing of series asks that we take seriously its conflation of repetitive structures and radical departures of their production to in and over time. To do so, I contend, will bring Tuttle's muddled series of systems into focus. And with that in mind, let's briefly consider some of these pieces spending a little more time on a couple at the front end. In system one, a solitary object is made of yellow feathers and aluminum foil, and it appears to float within the minimalist framework. Although highly abstract, this object resembles a bird in flight. Majestically suspended in the center of the system by steel cables, the weightless bird, unencumbered by the facts of gravity, conjures notion of essential transcendence Realization. Moreover, given that this is a representation of a system, it seems that systems here are set above and apart from reality, that is indeed above our groundedness. That the series of systems begins in this way with ambitions of idealization is important to acknowledge, for it would seem to establish the terms of the series of systems that are to come. While in systems two, the marginal framework of cables <coughs> remain, something seems here to have gone awry. The heaviness of the draped forms literally weighs on the suspension cables. Some pieces are slipping downwards, as seen in the black and white form, directing our eyes increasingly below instead of up, as in systems one. In systems three, a group of vibrantly colored paper balloons seems to effortlessly hover above the upper half. And recall, in doing so, that weightlessness of the bird in System 1. But if we look more closely, it becomes apparent that this bundle of balloons is hinged together by means of saran wrap. As if it were hurriedly and unevenly applied, a hasty attempt to preserve cohesion and levity among the cables that crisscross underneath it. Instead, of conveying weightlessness, of something suspended in the air as balloons typically do, this cluster of balloons appears to be in danger of coming apart, of falling below, something which the system even seems to anticipate. For underneath the bundle of balloons, we find a contraption that is like a safety net made of wood strips and cavernous balloon-like holes, an unsteady Alexander Calder mobile-like structure that is tenuously suspended from the cables above it with unfolded paper clips. Very difficult to see here, but it's unfolded and hooked in. It is, it is incapable of sustaining the weight of the forms above it, and it would appear as if the materials of this system, like number two, 
had a bias toward the ground. And speaking of the ground, there seems to be something about this system that is emerging in the base. Albeit an incomplete arrangement made from small and fragile and flimsy materials, yet this ephemerality and incompleteness might be the line of something. It is telling, it is resilient here, that this base seems to grow from the ground up, notably without any reliance on tricks of suspension as previously instantiated. And thus unfolds in different ways the series of systems, which insist always, it seems, on complicating notions of suspension and levity. Some are more dramatic than others, as we see in systems four, which literally subverts the familiar framework so that internal objects are hanging from the platform down, as it were. In systems five, the base is densely populated with forms that attempt to extend upwards but fail to do so, a feature that is most dramatically manifested in the stairs that start up but finally lead to nowhere. And of course, in system six, the earlier observations of unsettledness and the slipping of materiality downward becomes more aligned now with other systems. In system seven, it is significant to know that the cables here are functionless in sustaining suspension, for the central vertical form needs no support from above. Rather, it is formed from and secured by the materials in the base, though precariously so. We can observe also a formative structural shift here, because external objects in this system indeed appear to prop it up. What is more, the steel cables Previously, almost only the products of the upper part of the systems are notably now increasingly anchored to the base as if lines of force that direct our eyes downward and out. But actually, this use of cables, to be fair, was first seen in System 6, though arguably in a much more subtle fashion. While cables may draw our eyes downward here, we are equally confused by the ones that seem to hold this system in suspension from the ceiling. Even so, Tuttle seems to alert us that something is not quite right. First with the red felt balls, which act as if warning lights, and then to a working spotlight, which literally illuminates the reality of the system below. A system that moves inexorably toward the ground, to the very place on which we stand. The systems from number eight onward move increasingly toward the horizontal, with frameworks that become thinner or flimsier, or even disappear altogether. And significantly, the latter half of the series is installed directly on the floor, bereft of the bases that we once knew. Indeed, as Tuttle series unfolds, it becomes, excuse me, indeed, as Tuttle series unfolds, beyond its first piece, these systems move into our space. But why might total systems be made in this way? To what end this undermining of suspension and levity within these systems, and this movement towards the ground and the horizontal? Even at the end of the series, here in 12, we have no solution. For it only appears as if it is still under construction, <coughs> articulating only a sharp shift, an unclear shift, from 11 to 12. Enter again the Luz, who I contend will help in illuminating larger implications of total seriality, and specifically that of systems. That a series has movement both within its constitutive pieces and among them is just one of the many shared features between Tuttle's and Deleuze's seriality. We could look to a number of Deleuze's discussions in his philosophical oath about seriality, but given the compression of time today, suffice it to say that Deleuze understands the serial form as a process that is in perpetual motion, consisting of distinctive points that temporary, temporally and or spatially unfold, always in a disjunctive fashion and importantly, without recourse to methods or ends. Hence we can see on a basic level how total series has a kinship with the concept of Deleuze's series. But tunnel systems become more provocative when considered alongside Deleuze's idea of how a fluctuating, fluctuating and disparate seriality constitutes a concept of system. 
Taking together his discussions of seriality from the logic of sense and from difference and repetition, Deleuze conceives that any given structure, excuse me, any given system is structured at minimum by two heterogeneous series, one that is virtual and corporeal, one that is actual and incorporeal. These are not only constitutively disparate series in their singular forms, but are moreover disparate in their coupling. However, as we all well know, it is on the basis of this disparity that these two series communicate, that they resonate, and in turn, they generate the other requirement for Deleuze's notion of systems, the aleatory point, that paradoxical element that emerges in the in-between between the two series and moves throughout the virtual and the actual, a shifting point that is nowhere fixed, but always in flux, what Deleuze determined, determines in the logic of sense as a nomadic distribution. And as the allegory points shuttle simultaneously between the virtual and the actual, from singularity to singularity, the only kind of structure it can create is one that is metastable, a system that is ultimately unstable. As some Deleuzean scholars have argued, the aleatory point is as if an effect of this enigmatic dark precursor that element contained, Deleuze insists, in every system. And he describes this, of course, um, in difference of repetition with terms such as the indeterminate, the difference in itself, and the disparate. Yet however elusive or enigmatic the dark precursor may be, Deleuze also insists that it is what occurs under the influence of the dark precursor between these resonating series. series. And that is, of course, what he calls the emergence of an epiphany, also a difference of repetition. As we shall see, total seriality also has um, an epiphany that emerges in a similar medial positioning. And with this conceptual framework in mind, I return to total series of systems, wherein we can find a similar system of the virtual and actual, of the incorporeal and the corporeal. Conventionally, what we like about systems is that they work, and that they work efficiently. They provide a sense of assurance and stability. Whether mechanized or time-tested, systems are like their, their kindred concepts of methods. They're created in order to overcome variation, unpredictability, and in some cases, human error. Indeed, we might say that the very same things that we find so assuring and rewarding about systems are usually what makes series so satisfying. That linear movement from the beginning to the end, <coughs> an obvious logic, like the early series of Balzac and Dickens, where it all is properly shored up, problems are resolved, and questions are answered. But as total series of systems seems to suggest in its sequential but non-linear unfolding, these kinds of series are only idealizations. Indeed, are works of fiction rather than fact, a way of operating that is really unsustainable in the lived reality. For his mode of systems purposefully disavows an idealic model, a systematic way of moving, a systematic way of uh, contriving systems, we might say, and, and instead he moves away from the model initially conceived in systems um, one, which you see here in situ. I argue that total series of systems and their subsequent refusal to imitate the conditional model of number one, to give, um, to give form to idealizations, ultimately image what it is like to live with systems that are generated by and grounded in the stuff of our everyday world, made of humble everyday materials such as paper clips, rice paper, wooden molding, rubber tires, uh, toothpicks. Tunnel systems here are unapologetically slapdash, a means of construction that suggests that they are intuitively and provisionally created guided not by idealizations or methods that are perfect in procedure, but by the lived and sensible experiences, a kind of rift on um, Deleuze's transcendental uh, empiricism. And I would argue 
probably that this kind of transcendental empiricism first started to emerge here in Systems 3, this kind of thing that was uh, beginning to kind of grow out of the base. Following Deleuze, I contend that with any given series by title, and exemplified here by systems, two heterogeneous systems, or excuse me, series, are instantiated. On one hand, a series of differently imaged and seemingly fluctuating corporeals. And, on the other, a series of incorporeals, ever-shifting ideas, questions, and problems. Put otherwise, I view that any given system here, or any given object in any of Tuttle's systems, have a dynamic interplay between what we experience in the manifest world, and then the thoughts, the problems, the concepts, and even those multiplicities of the virtual that seemingly are engendered by our experiences of the manifest world. It is to be sure an unstable ontology that Tuttle manifests here in his systems. But as Deleuze would encourage throughout his philosophy, it ultimately finds a sense of meaning, an epiphany of sorts, in the in-between. Indeed, because our existence scuttles between the virtual and the actual, no system is static or fixed. And we know well these kinds of processual experiences, these processual systems. We have systems that are set in motion, in our mind, in our actions, by a kind of aleatory point that articulates difference, that incessantly moves, and likewise compels us into an ever-incessant movement to invent new systems, to become in time and in process, something that I argue Tuttle's varied and contingent constructions encourage over their non-linear and uh, two-year production. In this sense, Tuttle's systems elucidate the very concept of what it means to live through something, to exist in time, an existence that as imaged by Tuttle and as encouraged by Deleuze is happily always in process, always incoherent, and still unresolved.